Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this joint webinar on the ISV discussion paper, Business Combinations, Disclosures, Goodwill and Impairment. First of all, I'd like to say that it's a great pleasure and honor for the Portuguese Accounting Standard Setter, known as the CNC, to organize this joint webinar with the FRAG, the ISB, and the Portuguese Accountants and Auditors Associations. The CNC is proud to work together with the FRAG and the ISB, two very important accounting institutions. After the successful event last year in Lisbon, this is our second joint event with EFRAG, now online because of the coronavirus pandemic. I am also very happy that the IFRS Foundation is participating this year. I hope that our cooperation with the ISB can go on in the coming years. I also thank all the other panelists, the preparers of accounting information, Maria de Fatima Santos, Patricia Silva and Pedro Coimbra, and also my colleagues from the CNC, Pedro Aleixo Dias and Luiz Ana Coreto, for accepting the challenge to participate in, in this webinar. In accordance to EFRAG, in this webinar, we reached a record since about 300 people registered and will be participating today. Thus, I also thank the audience for joining us. The topic we are addressing today is a particularly important one. It continues to raise concerns despite many years of research, including that by the former president of the CNC, Professor Ana Maria Rodrigues, a PhD thesis under my supervision was on this topic almost 20 years ago. Thus, for me and for, for my CNC colleagues, this webinar is a way to remember and honor our esteemed former president. The topics of whether goodwill should be amortized or impaired and the need to disclose the reasons to justify the amount of the goodwill record were discussed by her in a passionate way. I am sure that we will share today the same passion for this topic. I wish you an enjoyable and highly productive webinar. I now, I now give the floor to Zach Gast, the new, uh, new ISV uh, board member who will comment on the ISV position. Good morning. Um, thank you to everyone for attending this outreach event to discuss the IASB's discussion paper, Business Combinations, Disclosures, Goodwill and Impairment. Before we start, we have some housekeeping. As with all of our presentations, any views we express today are our own views and may not necessarily be shared by the rest of the International Accounting Standards Board or the IFRS Foundation. This is a quite important set of proposals for the IASB. Uh, investors are really keen to receive better information about acquisitions, both at the time that acquisitions are made and to better understand subsequent performance. As many of you know, the thorny question of subsequent accounting for goodwill is one that has been of interest for many years and tends to give rise to quite polarized opinions. Questions have also been raised about the effectiveness of and the complexity of impairment testing for goodwill, and also the timeliness of the recognition of impairment. I really encourage people to respond to the discussion paper, which is outstanding. So to begin with our presentation, slide six provides an overview of our project on goodwill and impairment. The IASB started this after a post-implementation review of IFRS 3 and published our discussion paper in March. The deadline for submitting comment letters is the end of this year. While many think that the project is about the accounting for goodwill, in fact, the objective of the project is broader. The objective is to improve the information that companies provide to users of financial statements at a reasonable cost about the businesses those companies buy. The IASB hopes to help investors hold management to account for those acquisition decisions. So this discussion paper contains a number of specific questions for stakeholders. 
the IASB is particularly interested in hearing from stakeholders on how useful and feasible they think the new disclosure ideas are, as well as whether they have had any new evidence or arguments on the best way to account for goodwill. So moving on to slide seven, we summarize the IASB's preliminary views that are presented in the discussion paper. Those preliminary views cover three main areas and reflect concerns that IASB heard from stakeholders. The first area relates to disclosures. The IASB's preliminary view is that it should propose to require companies to disclose information about how business combinations perform after an acquisition. The second area relates to approving the accounting for goodwill. The ISB explored whether it could make the impairment test more effective, but its preliminary view was that it was not feasible to improve the test significantly at a reasonable cost. We then considered whether to propose reintroducing amortization and the ISB's preliminary view is that it should not do so because there is no compelling evidence that doing so would significantly improve financial reporting. And finally, the ISB explored some possible simplifications that would reduce the cost of uh, performing the impairment test by removing the requirement to perform the test annually and amending how value and use is estimated. The third and final area relates to some other topics. The ISB's preliminary view is that it should require companies to present total equity excluding goodwill on the balance sheet. The ISB also thinks it should retain the current approach of requiring companies to recognize identifiable intangible assets separately upon acquisition, rather than subsume some of those intangible assets into goodwill. We will only be discussing selected topics from the discussion paper today. It's perhaps worth just emphasizing here that the views in the discussion paper are preliminary, depending on the feedback and comments that the ISB receives from outreach events such as the one today and comment letters, the ISB may decide to reconsider some or all of these preliminary views. And with that, I'll pass it over to Craig. I think I'm um, coming in, in between. Thank you, Zach, for your presentation. So um, welcome to all of you also on behalf of AFRAC. Uh, like uh, Lucia Rodriguez was, uh, was saying, we are very pleased from our side as well to have another Portuguese event or Portuguese-oriented event with a lot of Portuguese speakers. Uh -huh. and we have a very good memory of the joint event, big event, physical event we organized in, uh, together in Lisbon almost two years ago. And we trust that this event will be as successful. Um, it's, this is one webinar in the series of, of many, but we are very pleased to do this with um, Portugal and a Portuguese orientation. Uh, when we see, actually now my uh, so results are disappeared, but I, um, I, when we see on the polling question, we ask you who are there in this call, not surprisingly, since we organized this webinar together with the accountancy profession Oroke, o, and OCC, uh, may, in the main part of the um, audience is has an accounting or an accountancy background. So probably very familiar with the topic. Um, my colleagues are going to present the AFRAC position, but I want to say a few words about the AFRAC uh, position. So we published our draft comment letter in, uh, in May, at the end of May, and uh, we asked for comments by the 30th of November. This is because our due process uh, uh, is aiming at giving the reactions to the ISB as soon as possible, but it means as well that uh, we have a difference of one month with the deadline of the ISB. So that is uh, a little bit a challenge for us to get all the inputs. So until the 30th of November, we do many things, including these webinars, where we hope to get a lot of input. We also have other uh, activities. We do field tests, we do interviews, and we have surveys for preparers. So today we um, hope to get further input, and you have seen that we have an excellent uh, Portuguese panel with, uh, of preparers, so they will tell us uh, whether at reasonable cost they can provide the information that the ISB is suggesting in the dis discussion paper uh, to their users. So um, in the... Uh, you will see later and also in our draft comment letter, you will see that we have not taken a position on the sort of main debate that is going on, reintroducing amortization of goodwill. So we are interesting to hear your views on that uh, as well today. 
I'm now passing on to Craig Smith from the technical staff from the ISP who will give you uh, the first introduction to the um, team on the disclosures. Craig, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Saskia. Um, and also thank you for, for inviting us. Uh, so as Saskia said, if we when I look at the, the first of the topics, which is the ISP's preliminary views on improving disclosures for acquisitions. One of the key messages that the ISP heard from investors is that companies generally do not disclose sufficient information to allow investors to assess how well a business combination has performed post-acquisition. Investors want this information to hold management to account for its decisions to acquire those businesses. Most investors tell us that the information is needed for stewardship purposes to help them, for example, determine whether they can trust management with future capital. Existing standards do not specifically require companies to disclose such information, and hence any information that is provided today is done so voluntarily. And therefore, the discussion paper is exploring whether to require companies to disclose information about the subsequent performance of business combinations. The ISP's preliminary view is that it should require companies to disclose three things in the year of acquisition. So firstly, the strategic rationale for the business combination. And this, re this rationale will be a high-level statement that links the business combination to the entity's overall strategy. Secondly, the key objectives of the specific business combination these being more detailed aims that management intends to achieve as a result of the business combination. Lastly, the metrics and targets that management are going to use to assess to what extent those key objectives are being achieved. And then in subsequent periods, the company will disclose the business combination's actual performance based on those metrics to enable users of financial statements to assess to what extent the key objectives identified at the acquisition date are actually being achieved. So if we move on to the next slide, this looks at what kind of information companies are actually going to need to disclose in subsequent years. And so there's a wide range of business combinations and they serve a wide range of purposes. And therefore the ISB concluded that no single metric would be suitable for every business combination. Therefore, the ISP is exploring what we call a management approach. In other words, the metrics disclosed be those that an entity's management uses internally to monitor whether they have met the objectives of the acquisition. Uh, such measures could be operational or financial or a mixture of both. Because acquisitions can involve large sums of money, the ISP presumes that most companies are monitoring their major acquisitions. But if management is not monitoring a business combination, the ISB believes that the company should disclose this fact rather than the ISB prescribe a minimum set of information to be disclosed. The discussion paper proposes defining management using the term chief operating decision maker, which is a term that's already used in IFRS standards to identify the disclosures required for segment reporting under IFRS 8. And so the main reason why the ISP is suggesting using the chief operating decision maker as a threshold in this new context is so that companies disclose the most important information about the most important business combinations. A lower threshold might result in excessive and costly disclosures, particularly for companies that make many acquisitions. One thing the ISP would like to hear stakeholders views on is whether using the chief operating decision maker as a threshold will lead to companies disclosing all of the material information that investors need about the business combinations that they need to hear about. The ISP is aware that some stakeholders have concerns about providing this information. So, for example, one concern might be that what if the acquired business is, is integrated into an existing part of the business post-acquisition? And the answer to that really depends on how management is monitoring the success of the business combination. So, for example, the chief operating decision maker might be monitoring the performance of the business combination using information about the combined business rather than the acquired business in isolation. And if that, was, and if that is the case, um, the company would disclose information on the metrics by the combined business the chief operating decision maker is using. The principle here is to, to disclose the information that management uses internally to monitor business combinations. 
the ISD is not expecting companies to create disclosures to satisfy these requirements, but instead to disclose the information that management are already using internally. Sometimes when we discuss the board's preliminary views on subsequent performance disclosures, the issue of integration is raised, and it sometimes sounds like it might prevent companies from monitoring the business combination, and therefore when integration occurs, management do not know how well the business combination is performing. However, when we have the opportunity to discuss this further with stakeholders, we often find that management are still monitoring the business combination in some manner, and are aware of how well a business combination is performing, at least in the early years, as the ISB expects. The discussion paper includes a discussion of other concerns the ISB has heard, including whether the information is commercially sensitive and whether it's verifiable. The ISP wants to explore these concerns with stakeholders and, and hopes that stakeholders raising these issues will be able to help the ISB find ways to address them because in the ISP's view it is a reasonable request from users of financial statements to ask for companies to provide information that will help them to understand better how the business combination is performing. So one final point on the subsequent performance disclosures is that some stakeholders have said that the board is asking for information of a type that should be included in management commentary rather than in financial statements. And they say that's because, uh, for example, strategic and its management's views and analyzing the performance of the business it, it could involve some non-GAAP measures. Nevertheless, the conceptual framework isn't a barrier to including such information in financial statements. And investors say that they're not getting enough information today about the subsequent performance of acquisitions there being no requirements in IFRS to provide this information. Um, and, and therefore, investors today are, are, the information that they're getting is being provided voluntarily by companies. And determining its preliminary view to propose including this as a, as a disclosure requirement in the financial statements, rather than something that companies might volunteer to provide in management commentary, the board put weight on ensuring that the information is made available to all investors. The ISB would like to hear from those stakeholders who think that this information should be included in management commentary. For example, how they would encourage uh, companies to provide this information otherwise. So if we move to the next slide then, um, this summarizes the ISB's preliminary views on some other targeted improvements to existing disclosures, including IFRS 3. These proposals are about the information provided in the year of acquisition, and they include re requiring the disclosure of expected synergies, uh, defining pension liabilities and debt assumed, as well as some changes to the actual and pro forma information uh, disclosed about the acquiree. So that covers the ISB's preliminary views on disclosures. And again, I'm handing back to Fredra from, from EFRAG. Thank you, Craig. Good morning, everybody. So as uh, Craig was uh, elaborating on the ISB's position, uh, my task this morning is to tell you about FRAC's preliminary views as set out in our draft comment letter. So firstly, there are certain aspects of the proposals that we think are very useful. These include the strategic rationale and objectives for an acquisition. Then secondly, whether an acquisition meets such objectives as well as the synergies related to such an acquisition. Lastly, we also consider that the pro forma revenue and operating profit disclosures as proposed by the ISB could be very useful to um, users. However, on the next slide, we discuss the we consider that the proposals might not solve the issues related to goodwill accounting. The reason for this is because the disclosures are focused on management objectives and is not necessarily tied to the goodwill um, book value. Secondly, as Craig explained, uh, while they consider the level of information to be disclosed should be focused on what the chief operating uh, decision maker of, uh, reviews, we consider that it should be the information received by a level lower than that. For example, the CEO uh, CODM, the segment C, uh, CEO or CODM. The reason for this is that it will ensure that significant but not necessarily the material uh, acquisitions are also covered. How uh, FBAG, however, questions the practicability and whether the benefits of these disclosures would outweigh the costs. 
We have also not formed a view whether these disclosures are place, placed in the financial statements or rather in the management commentary. As Craig discussed, the, the DP proposes that entities have to provide information if they stop monitoring an acquisition in the two years post that acquisition. EFRAC thinks that this disclosure is only required if they stop monitoring an uh, acquisition after three years. So we propose a longer monitoring uh, period. Lastly, we do not think that the pro forma information on cash flows from operating activities would be particularly useful. On the next slide, we discuss, I, uh, we elaborate on what we consider to be important and where we require further inputs. Craig mentioned commercial sensitivity, and we want to understand, like the ISB, what the concerns are relating to this and how we can overcome it. As I mentioned, we have not decided yet on the location of these disclosures, so we would welcome input on that as well. We also obviously have to consider the operational aspects of such a proposals, the cost, and whether there are specific constraints within jurisdictions in meeting such requirements. And also, of course, uh, the cost related to uh, disclosing figures uh, relating to acquisition-related transaction and integration costs, as well as those up uplifts due to the uh, PPA uh, ad acquisition. Uh, we also are interested in understanding whether users would be impacted by the information that an entity is not monitoring an acquisition, a significant acquisition. And lastly, in the context of balance and because we want to, uh, to avoid overload, we are also interested in understanding whether the current disclosure requirements in IFRS 3 could be removed uh, without causing a significant problem for users. I now hand over to Pedro Diaz and the panel. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to you all, especially our guests, uh, speakers in this uh, round table. Pedro Coimbra from Banco CTT, Fatima, Fatima Santos from Sograp, and Patricia Silva from Nós Comunicações. Uh, just to, to uh, explain that we shall have some polling questions during this round table and uh, also uh, some questions may be addressed by the participants in the chat uh, box so you are invited to use it uh, during the session and especially uh, uh, we will try to in the, in the end to reply to those questions um, so this is a very interesting issue, a special area indeed in, in, in all the field of accounting. Um, and uh, looking to the, to, the, to, to the question of uh, if can companies at a reasonable cost provide investors uh, with more useful information about their acquisitions, I invite Pedro Cabrita to uh, Coimbra to, to do a first consideration on this. Thank you, Pedro. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to provide my viewpoint on this topic, everlasting topic. Uh, this is my personal viewpoint. I've been with the Goodwill topic for more than 10 years now in various capacities and companies, uh, and mostly on the banking sector, where Goodwill is an important item or, and has been so for, for a while. And to your question, reasonable cost to provide further information or useful information to investors about acquisitions, uh, I understand the sensitivity of the topic and I agree with the board's preliminary view that further information could be useful uh, and beneficial to investors. And uh, as Zachary mentioned before, there's two topics here at acquisition when they have the goodwill is generated and afterwards uh, with the subsequent performance. On, on the first one, I would say that, at least from my experience, material acquisitions have always been addressed by management uh, regarding its objectives and its metrics. So I do see merits in, in um, pushing preparers to disclose what are the main objectives, be it growth, be it synergies, be it return on assets, being know-how. And I do see some merits in, in, in a high-level metrics uh, that can be provided. 
this for material acquisition. So in that sense, I agree with the board's view. And then and from a preparer's point of view, I do, I do see this as, as feasible and without unreasonable costs, uh, at least for, for the companies that I've been working with. On the afterwards, meaning the subsequent part, um, I, I do see also merits here, but here I think we need to be a bit careful uh, to try to center the goodwill discussion or the success or failure of an acquisition on the goodwill discussion. I, I think it oversimplifies the topic. I do see that we can, for a limited period, let's say two years, provide some feedback on the objectives that were initially stated, uh, but no more than two, three years for that subsequent period as this, uh, as time passes, uh, reality moves and objectives and targets also moves. And uh, at the end, I would say, uh, before passing back to you, Pedro, that's on, on exception, meaning on that acquisition, I see merits, I would caution against being too perspective prescriptive and in the second part, in the subsequent period, and give some leeway to managers and preparers in uh, how they address the, the investors community. So, Peter, this would be my, my, my initial comments on the topic, so I'll revert back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Patricia, can you have us uh, our, your view on this, please? Yes, yes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the, the invitation. It is great to participate in this webinar and contribute to this discussion of uh, the topics regarding business combinations. Uh, I, I agree with, with Pedro. Uh, uh, at the beginning and uh, on the time of the acquisitions, it is possible and uh, we, we understand the intention of providing more useful information for investors about the business acquired. Uh, I uh, do think that uh, on the subsequent measures and information, uh, we need to think on the cost to obtain uh, those, that, that information, uh, and we need to think uh, on the question regarding the reliability of the information needed to be to be provided. Uh, I think it is it can be costly and, and complex uh, due, uh, for instance, uh, to business and segment integration. Uh, it can be difficult to, to keep the tracking on the success or failure of an operation by, by itself. So uh, we understand the, the intention. Uh, in theory, uh, it is good, but uh, it can be difficult uh, to apply. Thank you very much. Can we go to the next uh, topic? Uh, how can transparency of the success or failure of an acquisition be improved? And I invite again Pedro to, to comment on and expose his views on this. Um, thank you, Pedro. And uh, so um, kind of linking up with what I have mentioned before on the, on the first, because they are interlinked the two, what we do at acquisition, what we monitor. Uh, I understand the the, 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 um, the need for transparency on, on the acquisition, but as I mentioned, so trying to center the success or the failure of an acquisition when just looking at goodwill or at goodwill discussion, I think it's oversimplification and might misdirect investors. Uh, acquisitions are done with a multitude of factors looking, for instance, I've seen acquisitions where the main goal is diversification, meaning diversifying the portfolio of business, which means that looking just at goodwill, it's, it's, it's a narrow view because if we're diversifying, we need to, hold, to look at the whole company, not just the assets. Uh, another example would be is, is, it, is if we're acquiring a company for its talent or its culture in an ever-changing world, is this captured in, in, in the goodwill discussion very hardly? So um, I do see the interest on the question, is, is it success or failure? I do not see this as interlinked directly with goodwill. And if we go in that road, I think we're, we're not providing the best services to, 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 to investors in understanding the, the overall uh, acquisition and the overall business uh, evolution. I don't know if Patricia uh, uh, or Fatima would like to add any 
point on, on this, uh, we can we can really uh, move to the to the next question. In, in, in the meantime, um, we can we can now uh, uh, see some uh, questions that uh, uh, the audience can also um, uh, reply, and we will see the results in the meantime. Um, moving on, and we will we'll get back to this in a minute. Um, in the meantime, um, I would invite Fatima to, call, to comment on what is a practical way to proceed considering confidentiality. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, um, in my view, uh, I completely understand uh, the rationale behind the, the requirements of disclosing information about the acquisitions. But uh, I must remind her that international standards also apply to companies that are not listed and are more small. So uh, I think that management might have concerns about disclosing all the information about what is the rational behind an acquisition and how it monitors, because sometimes, at least in wine business, uh, the acquisition is the first step for another acquisitions that may come, uh, because a company may grow organically or may grow by acquisition. And uh, it, I completely understand that management shall have concerns about disclosing to its competitors, which are the next steps, uh, and they uh, adopt countermeasures. Um, another question that uh, think, I think it might uh, be a concern of management is when we a, a company acquires a business that is after integrated and some restructuring plans must be in place and for the employees of both companies uh, it's it's complicated to see information about these uh, restructuring uh, plans these two concerns may happen i don't I don't think that uh, they could be a real concern in all acquisitions, but sometimes uh, they they may happen and may may increase the costs for preparers to obtain the necessary information about the need the new disclosures. And I understand that you have some questions there in the polling uh, uh, to be. That you can you can reply and uh, make it's very uh, clear to everybody to know what is the, the trend in this in this audience. Um, I would I would invite uh, also uh, Patricia if you want to add some views on this confidentiality. Okay. Okay. Yes, I, I can have my my point of view and uh, the point of view of a listed company. Uh, even in this case, we, we know we, we give a, a lot of information when the, the acquisitions happen. But uh, even in this case, uh, I think that uh, we need to be careful uh, about the, the confidentiality, the sensitivity and the, uh, the, uh, the commercial sensitive of the, of the uh, information. Companies, uh, because of that, will not provide all the information necessary to be useful. Management. Uh, will be very careful, not only externally, but also internally, to disclose this information. And because of this, this will difficult comparability between companies. Uh, as Fatima said, uh, it, it is sometimes an acquisition brings another acquisition, and uh, it will be always a concern of what information to be disclosed. Um, very well. As, as we are uh, moving to the to the last uh, issue here, uh, should the information be placed in the management commentary rather than the, the financial statement? Uh, I would invite uh, uh, so Patricia to again to give us our views on, on this, please. Okay, well, Pedro, uh, regarding this topic, uh, um, I think, in my point of view, the information should be placed in the in the management commentary rather than the, the financial statements. 
uh, I understand the concerns how to get the companies to disclose this information if it is considered on the management commentary. But uh, usually the main indicators that we uh, need to disclose to, to, evaluate, to evaluate and the, the subsequent uh, measures and performance of, of uh, acquisitions are uh, uh, in many cases not financial. We need to, to disclose market shares, market growth, uh, very operational indicators. Uh, or if, even if uh, they are financial indicators, they could be not IFRS compliant. Uh, so without a direct link to the financial statements, without a direct link to the book value of goodwill, as already mentioned here, uh, I think there is no reason to put uh, that information on the, on the financial statements. It will be uh, more the scope and the, the rationale. Uh, I think it's better for the management commentary. I don't know if my colleagues also agree. Yes, I, I would invite also Fatima to comment on this. Um, uh, and uh, we shall have in the meantime some of the results from this first uh, poll of, uh, of the two questions. I agree with Patricia. Um, I think that uh, uh, there is, as Craig said, no gap uh, metrics that we are talking about. Uh, and uh, when applicable, the correct place to put all the explanations regarding strategy, uh, uh, risks, and how the management performs an acquisition will be on the, on the management commentary. Uh, although I understand the, the, the arguments to place on the financial statements, because Somehow, they need to be verified, they need to be audited, they need to be, um, to be accurate. But the correct place from a theoretical point of view, of view should be the management commentary. Would you like to have something on this, on this topic? Uh, just I'll second what uh, Patricia and Fatima said. So uh, I definitely see this in 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 the management statements. I do see forward-looking topics which are always a concern in the financial statements. So therefore, management in the management commentaries is the appropriate position to 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 to, to for preparers to publish this data and information. Very well. I believe you you can now see. Um, that for the first two questions, uh, the first one regarding the proposed uh, disclosures of the management objectives, we have a, a well a prevalence of uh, uh, the third uh, reply. In principle, yes, but uh, due to the completeness, reliability, the ability to provide information in practice the information in many cases will not be particularly useful. So this accounts for uh, around 50% of the uh, replies. And to the second question, uh, where ISP proposed to provide information uh, on strategic rationale and so on, uh, there is a prevalence of nearly 65% uh, on, on the second uh, uh, option, uh, yes, this is a pragmatic approach, balancing the benefits of the disclosures with the cost of providing information. Uh, on this, also, I would invite the panelists to give their views on, on, on the such trends that from, are coming from the audience. Uh, I would say, and I'll kick this off uh, from, from from the polling, and uh, as far as I, I understand this, so I think w at least it's very aligned with my view. There's there's a clear majority on both on both questions for for what uh, I think myself and Pat Patricia and Fatima mentioned. So um, I think at least on this topic, there's alignment on the within the panel and the and the, and the, um, and the respondents, so, so no further comments, just to stress that on my side. Uh, 
Fatima Patrice, it's, it's this aligned with what we you were expecting uh, from from your presentations? Yes, yes, I think uh, it, it's it's uh, it's uh, aligned. Uh, as a prepared of the information, we we agree of uh, uh, the need to provide uh, more and useful information. But uh, preparing that and disclosing that could be difficult. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, it's always easy. We all understand. But when we go to the to reality, when we ask for the information, when we try to obtain, is always more difficult. And uh, a lot of concerns may happen. But uh, we completely understand the rationale. So. I believe we also have a reply to the next couple of questions. Um, and uh, I was just trying to uh, see, see the results. Um, um, my colleagues, uh, Bob Pedro, Fatima and Patricia, if you are um, now with us, I have the results here. And uh, uh, so, regarding this uh, third question that we have, we have put forward, we have a prevalence that uh, of around 61%. We are uh, trying to find out uh, if it's possible to disclose the the information related to the achievement of the targets. Sometimes it would be possible. Sometimes it would not be possible. So it's a mixed feelings here, more uh, to like a more or less uh, reply. And before going to the next one, uh, uh, Pedro, or Fatima, or Patricia, you want to comment on this? Trent, please. Well, uh, again, I'll, I'll kick off on this one. So just to say, uh, at least on the on the first question on uh, on the answers. Again, I think we're seeing eye to eye on this one. Uh, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's, it's not possible. What I mentioned, I, I think. Uh, um, the rules should give management leeway here to manage this information. There are different circumstances, different uh, as, as Fatima and Marie, uh, as uh, Patricia has mentioned, listed, non-listed, commercial sensitive, non-commercial sensitive. So I, I do think there should be leeway, and I understand the audience is on, on that side also. So mm -hmm. some judgment is, is needs to be made, and that should be up to the managers and, uh, and the preparers to, to, to make that judgment. Uh, I can I can support Pedro. Uh, there's a concern of the sensitiveness of the information, and sometimes it may be more difficult. Sometimes it may be more uh, easier. I think that the response go uh, on on what we have discussed. It's it's. There is no rule on acquisitions. Mm -hmm. There is no rule on the related disclosures, and there is no rule on the information that we need to prepare. Every acquisition is different, as every company that acquires is different. Uh, uh, for listed companies, it's more easy. For family one business, it's more difficult to obtain, to explain uh, the information. The users of the information are different. We are talking about different needs from investors, so the response are very aligned on what we are, are our views. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can have that uh, sometimes uh, regarding this uh, disclosure. We think uh, the information is already prepared and easy to, to disclose. Mm -hmm. uh, the matter is, and it, 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 it links uh, this point with the, the disclosure on the financial statements on the, or on the management commentary. Uh, who, who sometimes the management see the information uh, not uh, on the IFRS view and IFRS indicators, so uh, it's not so easy to disclose as the way the management uh, see it. So it's an additional problem. 
Uh, we are growing in number of, of uh, questions put in, uh, being put forward to the polling, and uh, we also need you to, to put forward some questions uh, for the um, next uh, Q&A uh, uh, session that we will have in, the, in a couple of minutes. Um, and so going to the last uh, polling question that we put forward, uh, we see that the most respondents were inclined to the, the, the first option. Yes, the information is important and should be audited. This, this relates really to the, the, the question that uh, if uh, you agree that uh, the ISB proposal to be present the proposed information um, in the notes to the financial statement. So there is a clear, clear prevalence here to this information is important and should be audited. Uh, I again would ask uh, my uh, uh, colleagues in the, in the round table, uh, Pedro, Fatima and Patricia, to, to comment on this, uh, where we see the, some, the management comments or the financial statement notes. I can start with this one. Uh, I think they are aligned with what we said, but I think the reason is not, we are not saying that the information should be on management commentary because we do not want that the information should be audit or verify. It's the correct place for a strategic rationals, is the correct place for putting metri metrics of known gap uh, because the, the management commentary is uh, some additional information that will help investors to understand the numbers itself. So it's the correct place. Um, uh, not because it will be more easy for preparers to put in the management commentary, at least on my view. Uh, yes, I, it's, uh, I, I reinforce my, my perspective. Uh, that uh, I agree with uh, with Fatima. It should be on the on the management uh, commentary. Uh, in, even uh, when we make an acquisition and uh, we we disclose the the announcement of the acquisition and we give some uh, guidance on the that acquisition, the proposals, the the main objectives. It is uh, not. Uh, it is information not linked to the financial statements, and then the subsequent measures should link to that information provided at the beginning. So the the environment, the the scope, all that uh, is uh, is uh, more suitable on the on the management commentary. Uh, even understanding that it it is important to be auditable and to be reviewed. The other colleagues may want to add some on this uh, uh, dual uh, chance to management comments or uh, financial statement notes. Yeah, yeah here uh, apparently the audience is, 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 uh, diff has a different perspective, although a slight majority. Uh, but uh, I second the points made by Fatima and Patricia. I, I do think that the acquisition is more than just gap numbers, and therefore the, the, the proper place to, to, to view them is the, in the management comments and not uh, the, the financial statements. I do understand the, the interest in, in the auditing, but uh, I think that's a too narrow view of the acquisition. Yes. Uh, it's clear that we have a, a, a really... A, prevalence of the man management view on this kind of information. Uh, we have a, a question here related to pro forma cash flows from, um, and uh, let me just, uh, pro forma information on cash flows from operating activities would not be particularly useful according to, to EFRA. So I understand that, um, uh, Frederick, perhaps you can make some uh, light on this uh, at this moment? I forgot to mute, sorry. So um, I think here the, the, uh, the normal disclosures around operating cash flows are 
are obviously governed by IAS 7 and would not be changed by these proposals. Mm -hmm. In this context, we just thought that the specific proposals by the ISB relating to, to the operating cash flows on a pro forma basis mm -hmm. would not be useful. So therefore, the concern around stuffing the channel with revenues, et cetera, that you would still be able to see in the normal um, uh, cash flow disclosures, and therefore that was why we didn't think it would add necessarily additional useful information. Thank you. Very well. Uh, I understand that Fatima can also help us on this on this point. Um, yes, I, I agree with uh, I don't understand the, how the cash flows will help investors in analyzing an acquisition. Uh, and, and additionally, it's very difficult when a company acquires another or a business to have pro forma cash flows. Although, uh, and it's, it's important to detail uh, when an acquisition occurs about the, the the revenues, the profit, the detailed information about uh, the adjustments on the fair value, I cannot see how the cash flow will help. Uh, I understand that sometimes we need to look at the cash flows rather than to look at the profit and loss because there are differences and the company may have uh, uh, profits but the cash may not work. But I think it will be very, very complicated to have that information and mm -hmm. I do not understand uh, uh, the, the, the usefulness of that. It's very interesting to see all this uh, happening and uh, more and more uh, uh, the audience is being responsive, responsive to, to, to the questions, both polling and putting questions that we can discuss here in this, uh, in this round table. We are, we are about to, to close uh, the little bit ahead, some minutes ahead of, of schedule. Um, I would like to invite uh, and know if any of the panelists would, would like to have any additional uh, point or any of the other speakers uh, uh, from ISP or EFRAG um, on this uh, first uh, round table about uh, uh, better uh, disclosures and uh, about acquisitions. It is a sensitive issue, we know. And we have covered all these uh, views. And uh, arriving at this point, I really would like to make like a, a final uh, roundup to see <clears throat> um, who could add anything more to this discussion at this point. From the panelists, any, any additional issues? Not on my side. Thank you, Pedro. No, no, thank you. Neither for me. Thank you. Right, okay. Very well. It was uh, like a kickoff uh, round table, and uh, I believe everybody now is more acquainted with all these procedures. And um, feel free to, to, to question us and put uh, all your uh, issues forward, and we will try, we will do our best to within the round table to, to, to supply the views and, and also uh, we have the ability to have the, the assistance both from uh, ISB and EFRAG and all other participants uh, speaking uh, to assist us on this kind of uh, discussion. And uh, at this point, I would hand over to Greg uh, if I might, to kick off the next uh, the next uh, topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Um, so we can have the, the slides back. That would be great. Um, so I think the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, as Pedro said, we'll we'll now discuss the the next main topic in the discussion paper, and that's the, the subsequent accounting for goodwill. So the two key pieces of feedback that stakeholders said were that impairment losses can be recognized too late, by which we mean investors have often reflected reductions in their valuations long before impairment losses are recognized by companies, 
And secondly, the stakeholder said that impairment test is costly and complex. So if we look at the, the ISP's work to improve the test's effectiveness first, and then we'll look at the ISP's efforts to reduce the cost and complexity of the test, and then also whether to reintroduce amortization. So the ISP identified two possible reasons for the too late issue. So the first one is that cash flow forecasts could still be too optimistic, uh, and secondly, what we call shielding. On the first issue, IS36, is, uh, it already requires management to use forecasts that are reasonable and supportable, and also to disclose information about the assumptions used to provide users of financial statements um, with information to assess the reliability of impairment tests. And so the, the ISP's preliminary views of, is, is that if forecasts are still too optimistic, given those requirements, then this is more of an implementation issue, and that's better dealt with by regulators and auditors rather than through additional standard setting. So if we move to the next slide, um, this explains the second issue, which can lead to impairment losses on goodwill and not being recognized when some stakeholders think that they should be, uh, and that's shielding. So before we start, um, an important point to mention here is that the impairment test isn't actually a direct test of goodwill. So goodwill doesn't generate cash flows on its own. It can only generate cash flows in combinations with groups of other assets. And, so it can only be tested for impairment with those other assets. Goodwill is therefore tested for impairment on a, in a, a cash guaranteeing unit or a group of cash guaranteeing units. The unit of account is the CGU or the group of CGUs, and hence the test is an indirect test. So this slide provides a simple illustration of the shielding issue. So if we look at the left-hand side of the slide, you have the acquired business. And for this acquired business, something hasn't turned out as expected. And an impairment loss would be recognized if the acquired business was tested in isolation. However, in most cases, the acquired business is integrated with some other part of the acquirer's business, often to achieve synergies. In this example, there's significant headroom in the existing business. Headroom is where the CGU's recoverable amount exceeds the carrying amount of its recognized assets, maybe from unrecognized internally generated goodwill or unrecognized intangibles. But because we are testing the combined business for impairment here as a, as a cash renting unit, no impairment loss is recognized. If we look on the right-hand side of the slide, the combined recoverable amount exceeds the combined carrying amount of the assets in that combined business. So the headroom of that existing uh, business is shielding the acquired goodwill from impairment. And hence, this simple example illustrates what could be a cause of the too late issue. Shielding occurs in the current impairment test because the reduction in value is first absorbed by the unrecognized headroom and impairment loss is recognized on acquired goodwill only if all of that headroom has been moved, used up. So moving on to slide 19 then, uh, the ISB looked at an approach to reduce the shielding effect by incorporating the, the headroom into the impairment test. And this approach compares the recoverable amount to the carrying amount of the recognized assets plus the headroom from the previous impairment test. This prevents the prior period headroom from automatically absorbing any reduction in the value of the combined business. The approach attempted to allocate at least some of the reduction to the acquired goodwill instead of allocating it first to the unrecognized headroom. But any allocation would still be imperfect because it's not possible to tell how much of the reduction relates to the acquired goodwill and how much of the reduction relates to the unrecognized headroom. In addition, the ISP found that this approach would be costly. And therefore, it's the ISP's preliminary view that it's not feasible to design a different impairment test that's significantly more effective than the current impairment test in IS36, and at least not at any reasonable cost. The ISP accepts the test is imperfect because goodwill has to be tested with other assets, some degree of shielding is always going to occur. The test will therefore not always provide a signal of how well a business combination is performing, but that doesn't mean that the test has failed, as some people say. Although cash flow forecasts are always going to be judgmental, applied well, the test should meet its objective of ensuring that the carrying amount of the cash generating unit as a whole is recoverable. The disclosures proposed on subsequent performance that we went through earlier should provide better information about the performance of a business combination than the impairment test can. 
And in fact, providing that information isn't actually the purpose of the impairment test. So if we move to the next slide, uh, the other bit of feedback from stakeholders during the post implementation review of IFRS 3 was that the impairment test is costly and complex to perform. And therefore, the ISB considered whether ways of reducing the cost of performing the impairment test without significantly impacting its robustness. So one of the reasons given for the cost of the test by companies is the requirement to perform the test even when there's no indicator of impairment. The ISB's preliminary view is that it should remove the requirement to perform a quantitative test annually. And instead, companies would need to assess at each reporting date whether there is an indicator of impairment. And if such an indicator exists, a company would then have to perform the quantitative test. And the change should reduce costs for companies, but there are mixed views as to the extent of that cost reduction. And there's also mixed views on the effect it would have on the robustness of the test. So the majority of the board considered it unlikely that performing the quantitative test every year will identify material impairment if there's no indicator that that goodwill is impaired. The performing it every year also can't solve the shielding issue, for example. But some believe that this does introduce further judgment into the test and that not performing the test regularly could result in a in a decline in the expertise with which companies perform the test. The ISB wants to hear stakeholders' views on this topic, and in particular, any specific examples where stakeholders might consider there to be additional judgments that companies make um, when assessing for indicators of impairment compared to when companies have to determine the assumptions used in that quantitative impairment test, or perhaps where those judgments made by companies might be harder for auditors to challenge. So if we move on to the next slide, the board also considered some simplifications by removing some existing restrictions on how value and use is estimated. And these could also improve the understandability of the impairment test. The board's preliminary view is that it should remove the requirement in IS 36 to exclude cash flows from uncommitted restructuring or from enhancements or improvements to assets in the cash flow forecast that companies use to estimate value and use. The board would also permit value and use estimates to be estimated on a post-tax basis using post-tax cash flows and post-tax discount rates. Stakeholders have said that excluding those cash flows can be difficult and estimates are generally performed on a post-tax basis in practice, and hence the changes should reduce costs and make the test easier to understand. So if you move to the next slide, um, in the post-implementation review, Several stakeholders said that the ISB should reconsider amortization of goodwill because amortization provides a mechanism that does target goodwill directly. The ISB therefore explored whether amortization of goodwill should be reintroduced. And this slide lists some of the arguments that the ISB has heard from stakeholders for, for both sides of this debate. Um, we've put corresponding arguments side by side Without going through the details for each argument, the slide shows that there, in this debate, there are about as many arguments supporting either approach. Uh, and before before moving to the next slide, just to, to clarify, when, when the, the ISB does talk about reintroducing amortization of goodwill, the impairment test will still exist. So the ISB is talking about amortization plus impairment or an impairment only model. So if we do move to the next slide then. Uh, the ISB's preliminary view is that it should retain the impairment only approach, but that was a very narrow majority of, of ISB members. Um, however, this preliminary view reflects the majority view that there's no compelling evidence that changing back to an amortization model would be a significant improvement to financial reporting. I know this isn't simply about which model that you think is better, but whether there's compelling evidence that a change is needed. Given the narrow vote, the ISB welcomes feedback on this topic um, from stakeholders, but just repeating some of the well-known arguments, for example, those listed on the previous slide, and that will not necessarily move the debate forward. And instead, the ISB is welcoming feedback that provides new evidence or new arguments, or perhaps reasons why previous arguments are more relevant now than when the ISB issued IFRS 3 back in 2004. So I'll now pass back to, to Katrine to talk about the EFRAG position. Thank you, Craig. 
Um, FRAC uh, shares the ISB reservations on the possibility to develop a different and more effective impairment approach. However, uh, FRAC believes that there are collateral areas of possible improvements. In particular, FRAC suggests to address some aspects of the shielding issue that uh, the guidance on allocation of goodwill to the test generating units could be enhanced to improve how the test is applied in practice. EFRA considered that the guidance could be clarified to help allocate goodwill to the lowest level possible that outweighs costs of impairment testing and information needs based on value relevance. There could be a rebuttable presumption to allocate goodwill one level below segment. Rebuttable presumption doesn't mean it has to be always on one level below. There could be good reasons to have it at segment level, but in these cases, it needs to be explained. The FRAC also suggests that the ISB could consider enhancing the guidance for reallocation of goodwill. It is currently driven by changes in the reporting structure, while changes in the test generation should be considered as the basis for such reallocation. Making the strategic rationale of an acquisition more transparent and monitoring the success of an acquisition could help to better structure such tests and better identify triggering events for goodwill impairment testing. On the next slide, you can see that in addition, the draft comment letter includes suggestions for addressing management over optimism. There are Proposed possible disclosure solutions for a better transparency of estimates made by management. EFRAC discussed different approaches. So there could be a kind of backtesting. The achievement of previous estimations could make over optimism transparent. Information on the assumption related to the period for which management has projected cash flows based on financial budgets uh, could be made more transparent. At the moment, there are um, in IRS 36, 134 um, requirements, but um, in practice, uh, the companies give mainly qualitative uh, disclosures about how they have made um, their assumptions in this budgeting period, detailed budgeting period. The growth rate is transparent for the terminal value, but the main value driver is how you go into the terminal value, and this could be made more transparent. Another approach could be to disclose uh, the current level of cash flows or earnings to allow users to estimate future cash flows themselves. So these, um, on the next slide, you can see that this is all addressed to the uh, constituents and EFRAC is seeking views from its constituents on uh, these matters. Um, as I was saying, uh, the allocation and um, reallocation is addressed on the slide. Uh, then um, whether the management over optimism is best addressed by regulators and, or, and auditors or by changing the accounting standards. And um, one other topic um, or related to these, the usefulness of the suggestions and the practicability of the suggestion made by EFRAC. Uh, we would like to receive input and um, understand a bit what uh, the views of, of constituents are in this regard. Another point that uh, is addressed in the draft comment letter is whether the ISB should allow reversal of impairment to take pressure from impairment testing. Um, that is something that uh, could be allowed for uh, maybe one year window until the assumptions are clear and that uh, maybe um, such impairment is uh, recognized in time. So in relation to simplifications, you can see on the next slide that um, EFRAC in its draft comment letter concurs that there is a potential to achieve cost savings in adopting an indicator only approach. However, EFRAC has reservations on the ISB proposal to move the requirement to perform an annual quantitative impairment test. EFRAC is concerned about the robustness of such tests. 
An impairment test is a complex process. If companies do not perform an impairment test regularly, their expertise in performing the test is likely to decline. Another concern is management over-optimism. The problem of management being too optimistic could be increased by auditors or regulators as no comparison to impairment tests prepared in previous years. A fact for sure notes that there are areas where it is obvious already from the indicator analysis that there is no need for impairment and as such the detailed um, calculation would not add useful information to assess the recoverability of the carrying amount. In these cases, EFRAC believes that an indicator-only approach may play a role and the ISB could consider leveraging on what is already in IS 36 paragraph 99. An indicator-only approach might, however, result in a lower reliance by users um, on the results of the impairment test. This could potentially accentuate the too little, too late uh, issue and could result in a further loss of information on uh, governance and management stewardship of uh, capital employed. EFRAC would be concerned that this could further reduce the effectiveness of the impairment test and the confidence on the reliability of the test. Um, EFRAC in general welcomes the other simplifications proposed by the ISB. Um, so on this slide, um, the, you can see that um, therefore EFRAC has raised several questions to constituents again. Um, the first question is uh, addressing the concerns of EFRAC. So whether these um, issues um, are relevant issues that EFRAC has discussed and um, what suggestions exist uh, to, to mitigate uh, this issue. In relation to the um, simplifications, EFRAC has questions um, to, to um, the post-tax inputs. Um, post-tax inputs um, might be complex to consider. Uh, for example, if there is a tax loss carry forward, then uh, there might be issues. Uh, it's already discussed in the old basis for conclusion of IRS 36, and we would like to understand a bit more about the challenges uh, of a post-tax calculation and what to consider and uh, maybe what's necessary to include in, in the standard. Um, and one topic is, um, is there any other cash flow to be considered for the value in use uh, calculation simplification, or is it is only the restructuring issue? Um, then on the next slide, um, we are coming to the um, question for um, impairment only or going back to amortization. EFRAC has not formed a view. That is something that was um, controversially discussed in EFRAC as well. EFRAC is seeking views from constituents. As a basis of uh, for such discussion, the discussion paper could have discussed the unit of account when accounting for goodwill, including how the guidance of the conceptual framework for financial reporting for selecting the unit of account had been considered by the ISB. EFRAC notes the general approach when accounting for non-current assets is to consider components with different useful lives separately. EFRAC's preliminary view is that uh, it, it could have been considered whether amortization could be performed on components of goodwill, considering um, which part of these uh, goodwill is wasting in nature and which part is non-wasting in nature. If goodwill were to be amortized, there should be a link between the information provided on when the entity is expected to benefit from the synergies and the amortization period of goodwill. So conceptual arguments exist in both directions, back to amortization or staying with the impairment only approach. EFRAC was doing research over several years 
in the past and considered academic research. Though it is difficult to make a decision on a conceptual basis, EFRAC Tech and EFRAC Board were divided. We have received similar feedback from European constituents, even within jurisdictions, views are divided. If there's no solution from a conceptual point of view, some suggest uh, to have a practical solution. Um, as I said, EFRAC has raised uh, several questions to constituents to um, go forward with the issue. And um, so you can see that this uh, component approach is addressed to what the character of goodwill is. Is it is a wasting asset? Is it is a um, non-wasting asset? Is it is a counting construct? And um, whether, the, for example, some information about the age of goodwill could help to, to go forward in this regard. Um, with this, I would like to hand back to Peter. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. Um, yes, I noticed that uh, many of you have entered the, the webinar in the, in the meantime. I will again um, do some uh, presentations and uh, remind some issues that we should address uh, from, from the participants. We have as guest speakers in this panel Pedro Coimbra, CFO of Banco CTP, Maria de Fatima Santos, Head of Global Financial Services of SOGA, and Patricia Silva, Head of Control Consolidation and Incentives of NOS Communications SA. Um, we will put forward during the session, um, we will cover uh, some four uh, main topics, three to four main topics. And we will put also, in the meantime, some polling questions. Uh, this should be replied by uh, the participants, and we will have the results and comments from uh, the panelists and other speakers that may want to comment on this. And uh, also, you can put your questions in the, in the chat box that shows up in your screen. Uh, this is being taken uh, to a set of uh, questions to be replied in the end of uh, the session uh, of this round table. So um, now we are there in the accounting of for goodwill. It's such a big issue everywhere. Um, especially we know we are in Europe and Europe has a special view on this, as we all know. Uh, and uh, uh, so, to start off, um, I would invite Fatima to comment on this uh, uh, first issue, if it is possible to make existing impairment tests more effective and would improving the guidance on, on goodwill allocation and reallocation help to address shielding. Uh, so for this uh, first uh, uh, question, please go ahead, uh, Fatima, please. Thank you, Peter. I don't think it's possible to make the actual test uh, more effective. And I do think that it's not working well. Otherwise, we will not be here discussing this topic. Uh, there is two real problems. Uh, that is the over-optimism of management, and there is shielding. Uh, over-optimism, I think it's a real question, but we must understand that companies develop business plans for uh, as a management tool, not only for the impairment test. And business plan must be ambitious, because business plans will serve also to set the targets for the management. And uh, in, in our business, at least, it depends on a lot of external factors. For example, climate change will affect the quality of the grapes in wine business, at least. There is a lot, a lot of explanations that will uh, uh, explain the, the fact that the projections will not be achieved. 
And uh, I don't agree with the ASBC uh, uh, conclusion of uh, dealing uh, or uh, uh, having that responsibility over the auditors and companies because there is a lot of difficult discussions between auditors and companies regarding the over-optimism or the shielding effect. Uh, and I do think that uh, uh, improving disclosures on backtesting, comparing the actual cash flows with the previous business plan could be a very much more objective disclosure than, for example, the rationale of the acquisition, although I understand. It's, it's very objective, it's very simple. Shielding effect exists. I, I, I lose a lot of hours trying to understand the uh, headroom approach, but it's too complex. Uh, having another approach, it will be more complex even. Uh, I think in our case, it's very simple because we acquire business and they ran uh, separately. There is no headroom, but uh, uh, in companies where the business are integrated, I think that it will be very useful to have more guidance on the allocation of goodwill to cash generating units uh, because it's the real problem. And actually, there is some flexibility, some judgment around this. Uh, I would invite Patricia also to put forward her views on this. Uh, okay. Uh, I agree with Fatima, uh, at least at some points. Uh, I think uh, uh, I understand the, the concerns about the over-optimism, for instance, uh, and I, I think it is difficult to improve the impairment test without additional costs. Um, but uh, I, I don't think uh, it, it's possible to have much more guidance on the, this matter of reallocation of goodwill. And I don't think that the, the comparison with uh, the, the projections in the past could uh, uh, help in this uh, over-optimism, because we know that business depend on uh, very uh, and many factors, external factors, and that uh, direct comparison with uh, the, the previous uh, projections can, uh, can uh, result in uh, very different reasons. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, at NOS, we, we have uh, a lot of uh, internal transactions. Uh, every year, we make uh, some reorganizations. So that uh, location of goodwill and that uh, comparison will, will be very difficult uh, because uh, we, we have the, the integrations. We, don't, uh, we cannot explain uh, if the results uh, are resulting from the, uh, the first acquisitions or from the integration of both uh, business. So uh, I understand the, the concerns, uh, but as, as Fatima said, uh, when we project and we make our business plans, our uh, budget, we, we need to be ambitious and the management put some pressure on uh, the best results. We try to uh, exclude that from uh, the projections for the impairment test, but uh, in that case, we need to have both approach which is not uh, easy and it is costly, but um, uh, the, the business runs uh, itself uh, with integrations, with external factors, so it's not easy to split uh, all these uh, impacts. Uh, uh, only, only to add to Patricia, we are aligned, but um, it, it's very difficult. There, there are always very difficult uh, discussions uh, uh, with auditors, with the regulators, when we are comparing the business plans, the real numbers with the actual, and around the assumptions on the business plans. Uh, and we are on a pandemic, so the, the, these difficulties will increase in the near future. We are now beginning the business plan and uh, putting all the, the, the conclusions on the goodwill on, on that analysis is one of the reasons why it's not working and goodwill amounts are increasing and in impairment loss are being recognized as too little, too late, I think. Pedro, I would like to add some more on this uh, before looking at the, the polling questions. Yeah, yeah uh, sure. Um, I would say here is, is perfectionism is, or seeking perfection is a, an enemy here. Um, this is very complex. I don't see how I can put it more effectively. 
at a reasonable cost and uh, and reducing judgment in fact i think if we move forward in that in in that re area it will be worse on both counts it will be costly more costly mm -hmm. and uh, more judgment and more difficult to to to, to evaluate uh, and as for shielding that greg presented and then some of colleagues mentioned it is an issue i don't think we can really really tackle that directly but at the end what's more important is is the asset recoverable or not so if it is um shielding is a, we shouldn't mess everything up with with looking at shielding if there's some shielding and the ad room is always there at least the asset is recoverable at least it's not above their fair value and that should be their focus so um i do think that putting more effectiveness here it's very risky um i do agree with the board's view as for optimism this is for auditors and investors i don't think we can regulate optimism and we can set standards on what optimism is uh in the banking industry every acquisition we do we have business plan we have to discuss this with the regulators uh definitely they are guide points that that, that are valid at the transaction date um is this is it optimistic or not it's anyone's guess so it is the management view and the, at the end the financial statements are the management view and the management answers for them so i do seek this as regulators and investors to ascertain if it's it is it is optimistic or not and therefore linking up with the first part of our discussion information and disclosure is important so the, so that that judgment is made by by investors so summing it up, I, I, I agree broadly with with Fatima and Patricia. It is difficult. I really cannot comment on the allocation topic. I don't have that much um, experience on allocation, but I do understand Fatima's point on the on the on, on, on this topic. So very well. this will be my feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have already the, the results from these uh, two questions, and uh, for the first one, um, where we check it. Uh, preliminary EISB view, if it is feasible to design a different test, we see that uh, around 59% uh, uh, goes to the yes, current goodwill allocation and goodwill reallocation requirements might provide room for opportunities to behave. And in the second uh, question, uh, we see that, uh, well, it's uh, not so much. Uh, uh, a strong tendency, but uh, with 44% disclose how cash, actual cash flows differ from management previous cash flows. Predictions of the back testing. Um, a quick comment from the panel on these uh, results? Uh, it's, it's, it's aligned with our views. Um, uh, most participants understand that it's feasible to disclose backtesting, although I agree with Patricia on that part. That does not mean that we have a loss. That, that means that we have a lot of explanations to give and some conclusions on the comfort of the comf of cash flows on the, on the next business plan. But it will be um, a simple and objective measure. And I like things that are more objective and simple. Uh, and um, on the, the first question, um, guidance on allocation of goodwill, although we deal with separate entities, we do not integrate usually. It's more easy for us. But, uh, and uh, consequently, I do not, do not have Patricia's expertise on allocation of segments and goodwill. We are a more simple entity. I think from what I read that there is room for judgment, there is flexibility, and when there is much room for, uh, for judgment, there is always the possibility to allocate goodwill to cash generating units that have headroom and and uh, it's possible i don't i i'm not saying that entities will do that but it's possible uh, and uh, the questions are uh, confirming that that concern is 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 also on the audience thank you very much any other comments or can we move to the next 
Oh. I, I, I have, so, Peter, sorry, uh, on this, on the back testing, just, just to provide the kind of different perspective. Um, I think the back testing, it kind of looks good, uh, but back testing which cash flows, what are the relevant cash flows? Is it free cash flow? Is it operating cash flow? Uh, there's plenty of views on what is the correct cash flow. So I, again, here on this, being too prescri prescriptive, it would be risky. Uh, for instance, if it's free cash flow, if we delay an investment, it, it, it appears that it's better, uh, but it's not. Uh, we're just delaying. If it's operating, uh, it might make more sense, uh, but it, does it go to, to working capital or not, uh, where the, there's different dynamics? So goodwill is a long-term asset. It's difficult for a one view on the first year of cash flows to take that much of a, of, of a view how this thing is going. So we, when we acquire a company here, we don't acquire for the cash flows of the first year. We acquire for the cash flows of multiple years. And therefore, even backtesting, I think it, it gives room for manipulation or misdirection of investors. But in many... Final comment on this. Okay. And for Very well. Uh, should uh, goodwill only be tested for impairment when there is an indication of impairment? So uh, let us hear from uh, Pedro. I think it's uh, the, the first comment is from you. Okay. Thank you, Pedro. So here. Um, I, I understand the board's preliminary view was is to 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 relieve companies from testing uh, yearly, at least quantitatively. Uh, I would say, from my experiences, uh, I, I would favor continuing the current approach of testing uh, the impairment annually. And why would I say that? So why would I defend that? It's qualitative triggers, although again, conceptually might make sense. They are also judgmental and tend to be quantitative. So I don't see that much of, a, of an improvement on, 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 on these topics, uh, meaning some costs will be needed and at least some judgment will be needed. Should we look at short-term indicators or long-term indicators? Should we look at unforeseen topics or non-unforeseen topics? So the, 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 the triggers by itself, it's already a decision which is, which is difficult. Uh, that's one reason. The other is goodwill is, is a sensitive asset. That's why we're having this discussion. This discussion comes, comes and goes in cycles. Uh, and therefore, testing is, is, is annually is a better way to at least uh, defend that asset. And there are benefits in having this exercise being done periodically so that ourselves, managers, auditors can see the, the movements and the, and the changes year by year, which makes the exercise more robust. Um, uh, also, as to the problem of being recognized too late impairments, uh, again, this, in, at least in my view, tends to be more aligned to having this test annually. If we don't test it annually, in fact, we're, 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 we're increasing the chances of being re of rec recognizing but impairments too late. So the test, the annual test is again a long-term view. Uh, I, I did, I did see some merits in the innovative approach to split goodwill between uh, what is a wasting and therefore amortizing asset that was mentioned before in the in the in the introduction of this topic. So uh, as far as I understood, there could be a, a, an approach that splits the goodwill in two. One is the wasting assets part of it, and the other is non-wasting part of it, and the first will be amortized. Uh, this conception looks appealing. I definitely look at, at it as uh, I've seen good wheels where I can clearly see some part of it is wasting. Uh, again, this is difficult in practice how to split, but I would not go against uh, ability for management to make that judgment if there's any split to be done or not. So, as a whole, summarizing, I'm definitely keen on keeping the annual test on the on, on the goodwill, and I think that favors uh, investors and and the, and the wider community.
So, Pedro, back to you. Yes, Patricia, you would like to have uh, any more views on this? Uh, okay, Pedro. Yes, uh, I, I can. Uh, I, I uh, generally agree with uh, with Pedro. Um, I think uh, uh, introducing another uh, judgmental that is an indicator to identify uh, uh, an ind indicator of impairment could be an additional judgmental and an additional uh, discussion. Performing a review of indicators can be as costly as performing the, the test. Uh, and overall, uh, for instance, for, uh, for NOSH, we are going to, to continue to make the evaluation proposals for, for internal uh, purposes of uh, making the evaluation of the company. So the, the additional cost of preparing the impairment test is not uh, as much as uh, probably having a discussion and, uh, and uh, identifying the indicators to, to evaluate if we must perform the impairment test uh, or not. And considering that we are not amortizing uh, goodwill, uh, and that, uh, in some cases, goodwill is uh, a material asset. Mm -hmm. uh, it it uh, probably would be better to perform the test uh, annually. Pedro? Any, okay. Any other views from our panelists? Can we move to the third uh, question? Are the suggested simplifications in relation to the calculation of value in use useful? Um, Patricia, I think it's uh, nice okay. to have your yeah. views on this. Yeah, I can comment on that. Uh, I, I agree with the suggested simplifications. Uh, first, uh, the pre-tax uh, rate. Uh, I think it's costly and complex to obtain a pre-tax uh, uh, rate. Uh, it is uh, usual, uh, difficult to understand. It's not uh, directly observable. And uh, we don't think it gives uh, or it provides uh, useful information at all. Uh, regarding future changes, uh, restructuring, uh, enhancing of uh, assets or other uh, transactions mm -hmm. or uh, uh, business, this is how the management really see the business internally. This is how the, the management evaluate the business. Uh, so it is costly to differentiate both approaches, the internal and the impairment test uh, approach. Uh, it's not easy to separate what comes from a new operation or what results from the previous operations associated with goodwill, mainly after integrations and other internal transactions. So uh, I really think that uh, suggests that the simplifications are, are, uh, are better and uh, should be uh, applied. Very well. Fatima, any additional thoughts on this? Totally agree with Patricia. Everything that is for simplifying the the, the actual test is welcome, and um, the, pro, the pre tax post tax is a very very uh, old question. Um, it, it's it's not feasible to do everything pre tax is is only on theory. Uh, the, the main assumptions on the discount rate are not uh, pre tax. It's difficult to to to. To, to go through a pre-tax to a post-tax. We do everything post-tax. Uh, regarding the cash flows, uh, uh, as Patricia said, uh, it's important to have the test aligned with as much as possible with the cash flows that are used for internal purposes. Uh, although I understand the concerns about some guidance on what restructuring uh, uh, costs should be included, only to have to be completely sure that we are uh, being Consistently uh, between all the companies. Any additional thoughts on this? <clears throat> no, no, uh, I'm, I'm aligned with with Fatima and Patricia, so no further comments on my side. Thank you. Um, please, I remind again that you can put forward questions. We have several questions now to the last Q and A, um, and in the meantime, the polling question also. Uh, has been uh, thrown out, and we will have the results in, uh, in a minute. And uh, um, just before going to the to the last uh, topic uh, and the last question here uh, relating the the amortization or not of goodwill, uh, let me see if, if we can have the the results from our polling 
uh, question that was put forward in some minutes ago. If not, if it's not yet the case, we will um, we will move forward and come back to the to the questions again. And um, so uh, now we have the, the results. Let me just uh, check here. So it is very, very split is the, the results here, <clears throat> considering the, the indicator only approach, um, removing the requirement to perform an annual quantitative um, test. So we see that it, it's 33% uh, to yes, 9% to no, 24% to no, with some comments about the complexity, and 33% uh, for no. Uh, a quick comment from, from our panel. Well, I would say, again, kicking this off, so uh, I think the we at the panel are aligned with the audience here, at least on the majority of the audience, which is no. Um, I would, um, and and we're on the preparer side, so so I guess if the preparers are willing to to to, to continue to do this annually, I think it's a benefit for investors. So willing and able, not just willing but able. Very well. My, may I also invite Fatima and Patricia if you want to add some comments on this? No, problem. I think I think it's okay. all. Yes. Very well. Uh, the last uh, the last question here is about: Is there new evidence or arguments uh, that our monetization of goodwill should be reintroduced? Um, you shall also have some polling questions here. Please be uh, responded to these questions, and uh, we are taking care of the also the Q and I questions that you are putting forward. I would invite so um, the three of you, perhaps starting with Pedro, uh, to comment on this last question, please. Um, okay, thank you again, Pedro. So, well. This has been going on for, for, for several years, this discussion, amortizing and non-amortizing. Um, I would say that I can see arguments on both sides, um, but I do see, I do not see today a compelling evidence to change rules. I think there's a cost in changing rules from time to time, and there are risks, especially some unforeseen. And uh, at least from my perspective, I don't see that compelling evidence. I do see a case for it, but not sufficient to 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 change the the, the current setup as as for amortization. I think there's a risk of hindering activity. This is a M and A activity is is very significant worldwide. It has benefits for the overall economy, and. Um, Introducing an amortization, although investors could see beyond the amortization, it will have PL impact, it will have dividend impacts, and therefore it will be a disruption, um, which that's a risk. Uh, look out also for um, level playing field between um, IFRS companies and, and non IFRS companies, uh, and this is critical in M&A, especially cross-border M&A. Um, if we amortize, for how long should we amortize? Who does that judgment? Is it prescriptive or who, who, who says how long it is? Um, and are we sure that 
all goodwill is a wasting asset. There's a discussion there. I don't know, and I've seen a question from from the audience audience there. I see a case for it, but is it all wasting, or at least if it's wasting, is it all wasting in 10 years, in 15 years? I think that's a very difficult discussion. So. Um, at least uh, as a whole, I don't see compelling evidence to change this, and I see risk if we change and, and uh, change rules from time to time on, on a topic like this, and I think it's a sensitive topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can proceed, Pedro. Uh, I, I, I do not have any strong argument in favor of the amortization. Uh, the only strong argument that I have is that uh, the test is not working, I think, and it is. it will be sometimes back to the basis and have the, the things and criteria more simple will be uh, better. Uh, I've changed my opinion over the last 10 years um, because of the difficulties, the judgment, the complexity all within all these discussions. I don't think that goodwill and responding to the question three that is 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 launched is not really a wasting asset, but whenever a company pays more than the fair value of the assets is because the company expects it as some synergies that uh, the company is expecting to recover, and uh, that synergies will be will be obtained, uh, there are no, no indefinite, they will be obtained at some point. And it's better to focus the discussions uh, with management on an acquisition, on the, uh, the definition of the useful life, uh, rather to the other, add more complexity to the test. Very well. Um, this is a very strong uh, issue. Let us see uh, the results that are being compiled re regarding these two last uh, questions. Uh, and uh, indeed, it is, it is uh, looking back, looking back while the results are coming, looking back to the press this last 30 years, uh, we've seen uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, cycles of uh, uh, amortizing, then uh, impairment testing, uh, and um, so it's not an easy issue, and uh, it is much related to really trying to understand what is the DNA of goodwill. Uh, but I leave that uh, to the floor when we discuss the q in a, in, a, in a moment. So we have the results now. Let me check this. And uh, are you in favor of introduction amortization of goodwill? And uh, the Portuguese uh, vote is uh, 49%. Uh, yes, perhaps heading around 48 and 29%. And uh, if uh, you think that goodwill should be divided in components, um, the prevalence of no with some 47 percent. Uh, this is more uh, clear, the, the, the trend of the voting, and uh, I would invite my uh, colleagues from the panel uh, to comment on this, please. Well, I, I can have some comments. Um, I, I understand the, the temptation to amortize goodwill is, uh, I can think, I can say, an uh, easy way to 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 take off the the goodwill from from our balance sheet, uh, I I have some concerns regarding the difficult to determine the useful life. Uh, we know that uh, it depends on the type of acquisitions and uh, many factors, but uh, we know that in some cases the benefits are kept for a long time. Uh, if they are not, uh, and uh, uh, even considering the difficulties of some environment tests. We can see uh, the, the impairment um, being registered if the benefits are not uh, kept. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, the, the, there, if, if the amortization 
regard, uh, trying to mm -hmm. avoid the impairment test is not uh, uh, a huge reason because at least in the first years we have to maintain the, the impairment test. So I'm not quite sure if this uh, amortization or introducing the amortization is the, the right uh, decision. I probably agree with, with uh, Pedro. Uh, we, we do not, uh, um, we should not change the, the rules and uh, make uh, this change uh, in, in, uh, in a quite short term. So uh, in adding the, the difficulties of uh, the judgment of the, the useful life and so on, I probably agree with uh, not uh, introducing the amortization. Very well. We have we have a, a, a tight schedule here. Perhaps uh, regarding the Q and A's, uh, I would start uh, if uh, we may uh, this final minutes uh, just to cover this uh, pandemic uh, uh, impact on on this kind of topics we have been discussing how to include COVID-19 uncertainty in a three to five year business plan. Um, I invite uh, any of our panelists to comment on this, which is very uh, timely at this moment. Okay, I, I can start. We, uh, in our business, we uh, um, are being impacted, at least at the cinema and the audiovisual segment. Uh, we are being, we are having a, a huge impact of this pandemic. Uh, so it's a, a really important matter. Uh, and uh, we are, we are now uh, doing our, our projections and our business plans. And we only can do this through the, the sensitivities uh, analysis because it's really difficult to, to have a projection of uh, how the pandemic will continue impacting our, our business on the, on the coming years. So we need to do that uh, doing very, uh, a lot of analysis and uh, sensitive analysis. I agree with Patricia. We are now starting our planning cycle and having the first budget. And uh, Sograp has also been affected, especially on the, um, the restaurants, hotels, and, and uh, tourism uh, channel. It's very difficult to do a business plan on this specific scenario. And the, the main question is when will be the, the when it, when will be the recovery. Uh, would the recovery be on the second semester of 2021 or uh, later? And shall we maintain everything as equal and consider that recover? Uh, it shall be the impact on the first year, shall be the impact on the fourth, on the five. It's a very difficult discussion. At the end, as Patricia said, uh, there will be always some judgment and some sensitive analysis. If we do on a different way, what will be the impact on the EBITDA? What will be the impact on the on the, the the revenue? And the fact that having different companies in different uh, uh, locations help at this moment. I would just uh, quickly add that um, for us and for me, so the plan is important, but the more important part is the planning part, which is, so we've been doing, we in the bank, on the banking sector, we're very much linked to the economic, economic environment. And so I'll say since July, we've been doing scenario planning, meaning different macroeconomic scenarios, how this plays out in our financial statements, and most importantly, how do we act under different scenarios? And that, that discussion has been very helpful in managing the business today and, and, and the uncertainty that we're, we're, we're faced against. So um, one business plan is not enough. We'll, we have scenario planning and we'll lock in one uh, probably in the short term. Very well. We, we are in a very tight schedule and uh, uh, we have elected this question uh, of the pandemic impacts uh, on this kind of topics to be the, our uh, Q&A uh, for uh, replying to participants. 
And uh, at this at this point, I, am, I would like to thank all the panelists and also very much to our team that is taking care of the polling questions and all this uh, 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 compiling the data for questions and answers and so on. And now I uh, pass to my dear colleague, uh, Luisa. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for being here, for attending at this webinar. Uh, first of all, I want to thank EFRAG and the IAST to, to organize with the CNC or OCC kind of this, this event. This, uh, the, Portuguese, um, the Portuguese people do like very much this kind of webinars and discussions. Um, as you probably know, I'm Luisa Macureta. I'm representing OROC at uh, CNC. And my role here is to present some final technical remarks and takeaways on this topic. Um, as we can see, this is very important and, re and a relevant issue for Portuguese. For We are many Portuguese attending to the, this webinar. We have um, many auditors, accountants, regulators, academics, and preparers. And uh, the polling uh, questions shows that we have some strong views in uh, some issues on the topic. Um, we have um, strong views on the need for objectiveness uh, on, the, on the accounting for goodwill. We have strong views on the cost of the preparing information, and probably uh, uh, the, the panelists said that the, prepare, the, the test is not so expensive, but uh, the, the participants are saying that the, the preparation of the information and the, 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 the kind of information we need to do the impairment test are, can be very costly. And we have some strong views on the need of the, the, the auditing of the information. Um, uh, and some of the, the attendants are concerned with the difficulty on the auditing of the information. Uh, about the auditing of the information and the gap uh, versus uh, non-GAAP information. I just want to remind that uh, IS, I, ASP is uh, another project, uh, have another project that uh, is uh, uh, dealing with the management performance measures, and uh, uh, ISB want to include in the in the notes some management measures and the discussion between information on the uh, management commentary or in the notes may uh, become an uh, important issue in the future too. Uh, concerning the technical uh, points, I just want to, to uh, address three different points on these uh, conclusion remarks. Um, when is yes, uh, about the optimistic. Uh, we, we talked uh, we talk very lot on optimistic, and I think there is one point I should uh, point out, is that uh, management must be uh, optimistic, and the auditors and the accountants should not um, should should not uh, uh, compile the management not to be optimistic because all of the board will say to the executive committees and to the manager that you must be optimistic. You have to be optimistic because we have, you have to believe in what you are doing and you, you have to be ambitious. Uh, and Fatima uh, uh, told that and, uh, and, and, and Pedro and Patricia and I strongly agree with this. So optimistic should not be an, an accounting issue <laughs> because all managers have to be optimistic. They believe in, in what they are doing. So please do not try to 
to, 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 to make management not so ambitious. That's not our role, our uh, accountants. We are, we are accountants and we should not uh, try to move out optimism from the management. That's one point. That's a very important point. I'm on a, a board too, and I know that all board members are saying to the management to be ambitious, and they have to be ambitious to, to make a good role in their management uh, profile. Um, another, another point uh, is uh, uh, related uh, to the to the to the prohibition or interdiction of reversion of uh, impairment loss. Um, sorry, uh, I, I know I have to to finish my presentation, but this is very important. We don't, uh, we, we cannot reverse uh, impairment loss on brands, but we can. Uh, sorry, sorry, we can reverse impairment loss on brands, but we cannot reverse impairment loss of goodwill. And maybe that's a point of delaying the the, the registration of a loss in the in the in the goodwill, because we know that we cannot reverse. So when we we do uh, recognize an impairment loss on goodwill. We have to be sure that the, the that in, that impairment is certain, and this certainty is not so objective as we want to to be. And the third point is about is of course uh, about uh, amortization. We uh, we uh, buy another business. We buy earnings because. We don't pay if uh, if they are not earnings. We only pay goodwill because we believe that goodwill is earnings, and earnings will be generated in the future. And when the future pass, uh, the, the, the earnings are being generated. So we uh, calculate many multiples when when we acquire some some business, and maybe a multiple, a price earnings multiple, a price earnings ratio is an maybe it is an indicative of the useful life of the goodwill. I don't see many people discussion the use of multiples to to calculate the useful life, but I would like uh, Efrag and ISB to to discuss this point. I'm sorry, I have to finish. Thank you, thank you all, thank you very much. Thank, thank you ISB, thank you Efrag for for this webinar in Portugal. We much appreciate your concern with our views on this topic. Thank you, and thank you all the panelists too. Uh, Pedro Dias, I think he's you now. I think it's Paula. Yes, it's Paula. Um. Paula, Paula Franco, are you there? I think you are there. Can you please say your final remarks and then Oscar? Hmm. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Hello. Hello, uh, dear Saskia, EFRAG uh, CEO, Zach Gass, uh, YAS board member, Lucy Lima Rodrigues, CNC vice president, uh, Oscar Figueiredo, Oroc Vaz. Vice President, dear speakers, dear all participants, I uh, hope you are doing well and that you enjoyed this conference. On behalf of uh, Ordem dos Contabilistas Certificados, I hereby want to congratulate uh, IFRS, CNC and OROC for this joint event about the business combinations, disclosure, goodwill and environment perspectives from Portugal. It was a pleasure to hear such interesting inputs and points of view from uh, our panelists, with whom I learned so much during this morning. OCC, as a professional regulator, always focuses its activities on the accountant's professional continuous development to make sure that the professionals are always qualified and prepared to promote during their daily activities for the profession public interest. 
the financial report is a key piece of this big puzzle that we all can uh, or that we all call economy economic economy and society not only better standards but the better standards application and use can strongly promote for the society development that in this in times like these are so important having this said OCC is always keen and available to organize events with multiple stakeholders and have these sessions uh, where such important topics and discuss it are discussed once again thank you for your time and attention i wish you all a great day be safe and continue to promote for the profession and society development thank you i think that's me now Okay. <clears throat> um, on behalf of Portuguese Institute of Auditors, I'd like uh, also to thank EFRAG and CNC, the Portuguese uh, um, Standard Setter for accounting, for organizing this important initiative and to discuss uh, with Portuguese stakeholders and other, uh, and other interested parties some aspects of the IASB discussion paper on the accounting and reporting of business combinations. A special thanks for today's three panelists, Pedro, Patricia and Maria de Fatima, from three quite different industry sectors that have shared their views and concerns on this subject. Accounting and reporting on business combinations, assessing the fair value of goodwill in particular, and disclosing information about the acquisition and the company's performance subsequent to that acquisition has always been challenging for management, for accountants, and for auditors, since it involves a reasonable degree of subject sub subjectivity, for example, in selecting assumptions, and also involves a lot of judgments in all the process. We welcome the efforts the international standard setters and the European organizations are doing in order to make reporting more transparent and useful for the market participants, bearing in mind that the costs for achieving it should not overcome, should not overcome the benefits it brings. As we have seen in today's discussion, there are different technical views and management sensitivities on the subject, we have discussed today, but we are confident that whatever the solutions that will be taken, they will be in the best interests of the market participants. Thanks again to you all and be safe.